Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Hi everyone and welcome back to A History Chronicle. My name is Charlotte. The last time I spoke to you like this, I told you how much I loved history and I do, but I also love true crime, murderers, mysteries, anything like that, I love it. So today I wanted to talk to you about Lizzie Borden. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, I have a cappuccino, and let's get talking about some scary stories. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born in 1860 on the 19th of July. Her father was Andrew Jackson Borden and her mother was Sarah Borden. They had previously had two other daughters, Emma and Alice. Alice unfortunately died when she was only two years old. They lived in a place called Fall River in Massachusetts in America. Andrew had cousins that lived in a particular place of Fall River called The Hill. This was the more affluent area of Fall River and their family was quite rich. Andrew's branch of the family however wasn't but he got into textiles, into property development and he made himself quite a large amount of money. When he died his estimated value was $300,000. So in today's money, that would be around eight and a half million dollars. So they were very, very rich. Andrew was very money savvy. He never really wanted to be like his cousins and live on the hill in the houses. And yeah, he never really wanted that. Sarah and Andrew had been married since 1845. They got married on Christmas day. They had their first daughter, Emma, on the 1st of March, 1851. So it was six years after they were married. Sarah completely doted on Emma. They were always together. They were always doing things. And in 1856, when Alice was born, Emma became like a second mum. She knew how to feed the baby. She knew how to clothe the baby, change her, everything. Emma was mummy number two and then sadly when she was two years old she passed away as i said earlier lizzie was then born on the 19th of july in 1860 and this was emma's second chance of being a mum it was obviously sarah's chance to have the family that she wanted and just like with alice emma helped to take care of lizzie unfortunately Alice's death was not the first tragedy that this family would have. On the 26th of March, 1863, Sarah passed away. Before she died, she made Emma promise that she would always look after Lizzie. And I think this put such a pressure on Emma. She was 12 years old and she's been asked by her mother to always look after her three-year-old sister. Emma took that promise so seriously and she did become a mother figure to Lizzie. They were always together. Flash forward a few years and on the 6th of June, 1865, Andrew remarried. He remarried a woman called Abby Gray. I don't think this was a love match. I think this was more companionship. Now, Abby is always portrayed as this horrible stepmother person i mean if you think of most films most stepmothers are portrayed as like the evil disney stepmom but she wasn't she wanted the girls to like her she went into the marriage knowing obviously that andrew had two children and wanting them to feel that they could always go to her that they could talk to her the following year emma was sent away to a school um this school was quite a few miles away from the home. The reason that I think Andrew did this was because Lizzie and Emma had grown so close together that they weren't really giving Abby a chance. Emma did not like the fact that this new woman was coming in trying to take over the position of being a mum. She didn't like it. 
So I think that he sent her away because she was getting too motherly towards Lizzie and Lizzie didn't really have a chance to get to know Abby. While Emma was away at school, Abby and Lizzie did grow very close. Lizzie would send Emma letters telling her that her and mother had been out, had gone to the shop, said, you know, everything that they were doing in day-to-day -day life, but she referred to Abby as mum. And Emma was not happy. Emma would write her letters back saying, she's not your mother, she's Mrs. Borden. We had a mother and our mother has died. She's not your mum. Something put a strain on Abby and Lizzie's relationship. Because after this point, Abby was always referred to as Mrs. Borden. She was no longer referred to as mum. In 1873, the family decided on a little bit of an upgrade to their home. And they moved to 92 Second Street. This was a little bit of a weird layout house. It used to be two homes and they were merged into one when the family bought it. So downstairs was the layout of a normal home. Upstairs was a little bit different. To get to the front bedrooms, you would have to go up the staircase near the front door. To get to the back bedrooms, you would have to go up the staircase in the back of the house where the kitchen was. So it was a little bit of a weird layout. There were doors upstairs connecting everyone's rooms, but normally the family would keep furniture up against them. So Lizzie had a door in her room that would connect to her father and Abby's room. And she would keep a very large desk up against the door and the door was always locked. So it was a bit weird. There weren't really a lot of corridors. Like a house that we would know now. Just doors. Open straight up into people's rooms. The girls were always very well taken care of. Even though Andrew was a bit of a penny pincher, the girls had allowances for dresses. They were able to go out shopping. You know, the family was never destitute. It wasn't like, you know, Andrew would say, no, you've got one dress and that's all you're having. But Lizzie wanted more. Lizzie was one of these, what I like to call little rich girls, who think that they are owed something. And after they moved into the house on Second Street, Lizzie thought that this shouldn't be for her. Her cousins were constantly going to parties up on the hill. They were having extravagant bashes and meeting rich men that they could fall in love with and marry. And Lizzie didn't have this. Lizzie didn't have her stepping out into society party because Andrew didn't want to have to pay for something. Lizzie honestly wanted so badly to live up on the hill with her cousins and she resented her father that he wouldn't do that for her. After they moved into the home they did hire a maid called Bridget Sullivan but the family would refer to her as Maggie. Some think that this was a racial slur because Bridget was Irish. Others think it's because they had had a maid in the past called Maggie and they just didn't want to have to learn a new name. Lizzie was a prolific shoplifter. There was not a shop in Fall River that she wouldn't go into and take something from. It got so bad that instead of chastising his daughter and actually punishing her, Andrew just asked the stores to write everything down and at the end of the month, he would pay Lizzie's bill. This is why I think she was a very entitled young lady. She never had any repercussions. Although she would rob, Andrew and Lizzie were very close. They'd go fishing together, she'd help him with businesses. Honestly, if Lizzie would have been a man, she would have been the perfect person to have taken over all of Andrew's businesses. Lizzie and Emma had a huge falling out with their father when he had bought a house for Abby's half-sister and her family. The girls weren't happy. They still lived on Second Street with their family. They weren't able to go and have a house on the hill and, you know, have their own lives. They had to stay with their parents. So with Andrew being his property developing self, he said to the girls, okay, that's fine. 
what if I give you a home? So he gave them the home that they had left, the home that they were born into, the one that they had moved out of to move to Second Street. And the girls were like, okay, yeah, that's no problem. They didn't move out though. They decided to rent the home out and have the rent divided up between the two of them so they would have their own income. On the 2nd of August, 1892, all the family came down with an illness. There was a few theories as to why they were ill. Someone said it was the mutton. Others had said it was bread. You know, there was a few theories flying around. On this same day, Lizzie decided that she was gonna go out and go to the pharmacy. And she needed to pick up some prosic acid, which is basically cyanide. She told the pharmacy it was because she wanted to clean her seal skin. Who has that? A seal skin cape. The pharmacy told her he was unable to sell her this item because she didn't have a prescription for it. Lizzie kicked up a bit of a fuss and told him, no, that can't be true, I've brought it here before. But because it was cyanide, the pharmacy said without prescription, there was nothing he could do. So Lizzie gave up and left. Why would you want to buy cyanide? Why would you have a seal skin cape? I know this was very different times, but still. What? The day after, on the 3rd of August, Lizzie's uncle John, who was her mother Sarah's brother, came to the home. He came to visit them. He had family close by as well, so he was doing a little bit of the rounds on those few days. And he had turned up at the house. At this time, Emma had gone away for a couple of days and on the same night, Lizzie had decided to go to one of her friend Alice's house. While she was there, she told Alice something a little bit disturbing. She said that she was worried that someone was trying to kill her father. She said to Alice that she thought the reason that they were all ill was because of the bread that they had eaten. But Alice pointed out that if it was the bread, then everyone in the town would have been ill and they weren't so then lizzie changed it and said well it, it could have been the milk that was left on our front door someone could have poisoned it it's almost like she's trying to leave little breadcrumbs for people to put together so people wouldn't suspect her on the 5th of august john was the first person to wake up in the household he woke up at six he came downstairs and was shortly joined by Andrew and Abby. Bridget woke up around about half six. She still wasn't feeling very well, but she got up, got dressed and went downstairs. And John, Abby and Andrew all had breakfast around about seven. John then left around about nine, followed by Andrew. Each time someone left, they would lock the door. After Andrew left, Abby went upstairs to change the pillows and do some cleaning in John's bedroom. So obviously the house would be nice and presentable for when John came back later that day. After John and Andrew had gone, Lizzie then came downstairs and sat in the kitchen and had a coffee. And Bridget had asked her if she would like any breakfast, but she said that she was just gonna have a maple cookie and that she would be fine. With Bridget still not being well, she ended up running from the house into the garden and was actually sick. When she came back in, she locked the screen door and turned to find Abby in the kitchen. And Abby asked her if she could wash all of the house windows inside and out. She wasn't very happy about it because obviously she wasn't very well. But she did it anyway. Bridget had cleaned the outside windows on the back of the house and as she came back in she could hear someone trying to get in the front door and it was Andrew. She went to the front door and as I said they do keep the doors locked in the house but these were quite tightly locked like a lot of the locks were shut and Bridget heard someone upstairs laughing and she thought it was Lizzie. She panicked and was trying to open the doors she finally got them open and Andrew came in. Andrew went to sit in the sitting room and Bridget heard Lizzie go into the living room and talk to her father. While they were talking, he asked her where Abby was and Lizzie told him that she had had a letter saying that one of her friends were ill and asking if she could come and look after them, so she'd left. 
When Lizzie left the sitting room, Andrew fell asleep on the sofa and Lizzie went into the kitchen to see Bridget and do some ironing. And while she was in there, Bridget asked her who the friend was. Like, I, I didn't hear the door. And Lizzie replied, oh, I don't know. While she was doing the ironing, Lizzie then asked Bridget, oh, are you going out today? Like, you know, what's the plans? And Bridget said she didn't think she would because she was still feeling a little bit ill, but she wasn't sure she might do later. It's weird, isn't it? She's always constantly trying to find out where people are and what they're doing. Bridget decided that she really wasn't very well. So she went upstairs to have a rest. She didn't sleep. She spent the entire time trying to sleep. About 15 minutes later, she heard a scream coming from downstairs and she heard Lizzie yelling, Maggie, come quick, someone has killed father. Maggie got up, ran down the stairs, came into the sitting room and that was when she found Mr. Borden with 11 wax of an axe. Lizzie asked Bridget to run across the road to where the doctor lived and get the doctor, which she did. When Bridget came back with the doctor, he went into the sitting room to check on Mr. Borden. And then Lizzie said to Bridget, I want you to go get Alice. Go and get Alice for me. I, I need her here. Like, what, what are you doing? Why do you keep people sending people out of the house? Like, what? Lizzie's next door neighbour, Mrs. Churchill, had seen a bit of a kerfuffle around the house. And she came into the home to see what was going on. And Lizzie told her, someone's come in the house and they've murdered my father. Dr. Bowen went into the sitting room and he pronounced Andrew dead. He had so many injuries to his head. He was unrecognisable. Then Mrs. Churchill from next door asked Lizzie, where's Mrs. Borden, where's Abby? And without a beat, Lizzie said, oh, I think she came home. I think someone should go and check on her. So Bridget and Mrs. Churchill went upstairs. They climbed a few of the steps and were on the landing and they could see Abby's feet at the end of the bed from the spare bedroom. And they both ran away. They didn't, they didn't want to go up there. When eventually someone went up, they found Abby murdered. She had been struck in the back of the head with an ax. And they figured out that she had been dead 90 minutes before Mr. Borden had been murdered. So when he came home, his wife was upstairs dead. Alice and Lizzie and Bridget all went into the kitchen. Back in those days, it was known that women would faint at the slightest thing. So in order to make sure that Lizzie did not faint or pass out or anything like that, Alice, being the really good friend, started to unbutton Lizzie's top button on her dress. And she battered her hands away. She was like, I'm not gonna faint, I'm not. She then went upstairs. So in the morning, she had been wearing a blue dress everyone had seen her in this blue dress. She went upstairs and she got changed. Officer Allen was the first police officer on the scene. Um, they weren't really sure what to expect and so only one officer was sent. He came in and spoke to Dr Bowen, found out exactly what had happened and then sent for more police. When they got there, they noted how little blood was actually around where both victims have been killed. The police went into the kitchen and spoke to Lizzie and asked her where she had been. And this is where it gets a bit weird. Lizzie told them that she'd been ironing in the kitchen and then she went out into the garden and went to sit in the barn uh, because she needed to get some iron to fix some things in the house. But on her way to the barn, she saw a pear tree. She picked three pears, went into the barn and sat in there, um, ate these three pears, tried to find some iron. And then she heard um, someone fall 
and she heard a groan and that's what made her go into the house so i don't know the layout obviously of the the barn or things like that but you wouldn't really hear a groan like the barns out the back the sitting rooms at the front of the house you know it wouldn't really be something that you would have heard the police thought that she was being really off and when they asked her if her father had had any enemies she said no but alice quickly jumped in and was like oh that's that's not what you said to me last night like you know you told me that you think someone was trying to murder your father and lizzie said oh yeah yeah we we were really ill the other day and i think it's possible that someone you know wanted to hurt my dad so he was trying to kill them they asked lizzie if he had had any issues with any tenants or business partners or anything and she said that a few months ago she had heard a discussion between her father and a business associate and it sounded quite heated so automatically she's trying to push the blame onto everyone else obviously now with having crime programs galore on netflix youtube everywhere um with things like csi and things like that we all know that if there's a crime the first thing you need to do is preserve the scene obviously this wasn't known back then which is why lizzie had you know a doctor the next door neighbor and a friend all in the house where this crime had been committed so the police officers asked lizzie if it's possible to search the house and lizzie's response was is this necessary like your dad's just been murdered okay you didn't care about your stepmom but your dad has just been murdered and you're asking if a police search in your house is necessary after the police left lizzie stayed in the house that night i wouldn't i wouldn't want to um a note had been sent for emma to come home straight away because obviously she was away and alice stayed with lizzie on the 9th of august the inquest into andrew and abby's murder was held Lizzie was asked a couple of questions and he or she went really weird. She had been on morphine for her nerves. She'd been prescribed that. But her question, well, the answers to her questions, they were really all over the place. Like they would ask her a question and she'd tell them and then they'd ask another question and then go back to the previous question and she'd change her answer completely. She also said that when her father got home and they were in the sitting room, she removed his boots and put on his slippers. But the pictures clearly show her father wearing his boots. So that couldn't have happened. Yes, it could have been shock. She had seen her father. She was the one that found him. But yeah, I just think it's really weird. The inquest was adjourned. And in November, a grand jury decided that lizzie was not guilty but they had found new evidence and this was from lizzie's friend alice alice said that she had gone to lizzie's house and had seen lizzie burning a dress and she thought it was really weird and she asked her like why, why are you burning that dress and lizzie said it was because i got paint on my dress this was enough to change the grand jury's opinion and Lizzie was arrested and held for the murder of Abby and Andrew. The trial began on the 5th of June 1893 and this took place in New Bedford Courthouse. The prosecution's reasoning for wanting to find Lizzie guilty was because she was the only person that could have done it. The house was locked, there was no one else there, the maid had an alibi Lizzie was the only one who could have done it. The entire time that the prosecution were talking, they would refer to Abby as Lizzie's mother. And at one point, Lizzie had had enough. And in the middle of the courtroom yelled, she wasn't my mother. She was Mrs. Borden. Still, after this poor woman had been murdered, Lizzie still didn't want to refer to her as her mother. When Alice took the stand, the prosecution had asked what dress Lizzie was wearing when she got there. 
and Alice had said that she was wearing a blue dress and that she ended up changing it. But the defence pointed out, if you had murdered someone, why would you be so open about changing your dress? Like, you would have changed your dress before. The dress issue is a big thing in the Lizzie Borden case because dresses in those times were extremely hard to get in and out of, especially if you were the only person doing it. Lizzie was asked about the note that Abby had received and asked, you know, what did she do with it afterwards? Like, because we, we didn't find a note, so what would she have done? Would she have burnt it? And Lizzie said, yes, she must have. She didn't know. Was there a note? Was there not a note? Clearly there wasn't because she'd been murdered. So why say that there was an outcome? One of the other defences that Lizzie's lawyers played with was the fact that the timeline was so short. Between Andrew's death and Lizzie yelling for Bridget, there was only about an eight to 12 minute window. And they said that if Lizzie had done the crime, she wouldn't have had time to then quickly run upstairs, get changed and come downstairs. And that's why I said the big dress debate was always a big thing with this case. The last thing that I think probably clenched it was the fact that her defence team had said that during the inquest, when Lizzie was asked all the questions, she hadn't been read her rights. She was treated like a prisoner. But she didn't know that she was a prisoner and that under her fifth amendment she had the right to remain silent on the 20th of june after an hour and a half of discussions the jury found lizzie borden not guilty they cleared her of the crime which i think is ridiculous <laughs> after the trial lizzie and emma both moved to a house on the hill called maplecroft Emma ended up leaving in 1905 and Lizzie remained there. She died on the 1st of June 1927. So there are plenty of theories as to why she did it. The one I like, because I always tell you the ones I like, the one I like is that Lizzie and Bridget planned the murder together because they were in love. And I think that's why Emma left. I think they moved to the house on the hill, Bridget went with them, they started having their relationship and Emma found it unbearable and she just couldn't live with her sister anymore. So she left. If you are fascinated by Lizzie Borden, like I am, you can do something that I would be dying to do. <laughs> and that is go to Massachusetts and stay in Lizzie Borden's house. Yep. 92 Second Street is now a B and B, so you can stay in the murder house. You can stay in Lizzie's room. You can stay in the spare room. You can stay in Abby or Andrew's room. Yeah, and I'm so jealous if you do that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for watching my video. If you like it, please, please, please give it a thumbs up and hit that little subscribe button down the bottom. It really, really helps, and it really makes me happy as well. So thank you very much and until next time, bye.